folks, Canadian Prepper here. Welcome back to the Daily Dose of Doom and Gloom. We need to talk about why this one map right here says it all. This is why the millionaires and billionaires from around the world are building deeper and bigger subterranean complexes, fortresses, bunkers, whatever you want to call them, and loading them to the nines with emergency provisions because the writing is definitely on the wall. Before I dive into that and other current events of the day, I got to say, guys, you are in for a treat in the next couple months. This channel is just stacked with all manner of survival experts from all walks of life. I'm talking about off-grid homesteader uh, enthusiast experts I would say I would call them experts we got survival experts who've lived six months in the wilderness alone hint hint we got green berets we got celebrities coming on the channel we got uh, the world's foremost bunker builder who just did a one year tour he went everywhere Europe Southeast Asia he's got stories to tell about how the governments and the elites of the world, what they are doing to prepare for what may well be inevitable after what I tell you today. We have uh, martial arts experts. I mean, just the list goes on. I, we got so much content coming up. It's not just a blowhard in a car. I assure you guys that if this is your first video that you're seeing on this channel, go check out our other content. I assure you it's a lot higher production, but you came here for the information, so let's STFU and get right to it. Okay, so this map, why it's so important and why the game is about to change on the Ukrainian front. You see this right here, that's the Ukrainian front line, essentially. And this is the Crimean Kerch Bridge. The distance from there to there is about 260 kilometers. That's about the same distance as the Storm Shadow missiles that the United Kingdom is going to be sending to Ukraine. In fact, they're likely already there. That means that Ukraine is going to use these to target the Kerch Bridge, the Crimean Bridge, which is potentially going to enable them to at least create a bottleneck of supplies uh, the Russians are not going to be able to resupply from the mainland as easily because this is the only way if if in fact they are able to uh, cut off the land bridge killing the Kerch Bridge is going to be absolutely critical and this could be a game changer in the conflict game changer in the sense that it's going to get nuclear okay because the Russians are not going to forfeit Crimea they simply cannot now I want you to think about the incremental nature of this mission creep because every time we send in new weapons we got to send in more planes closed plain clothes guys mercenaries who are not officially representing uh the country that these weapon systems are coming from but they're just you know freelance they're retired ex-military whatever um still obviously working in the interests of nato hegemony how whatever you want to make of that and this is this is the recipe because you'll notice, and I've noticed this, it's almost as if, and I'm sure this will come out in a leak at some point, that all of this is prescripted. Okay, and I'm talking about the rollout of these more lethal, potent weapon systems. These escalatory weapon systems. You'll notice that it's just step by step by step by step. And every step, it's a different country that does it. So you'll have the United States that sends the HIMARS, okay? Then you'll have the French who might send some armored fighting vehicles. Then you'll have the Germans who will send some leopard tanks. Then you'll get the United States who will send the gravity bombs with a slightly higher range than the, the ammunition that they provided originally for the HIMARS. Then you'll have the UK now sending the long-range missiles. And what this staggering does is not only it incrementally draws it out so it kind of normalizes the new state of NATO support, but it also prevents an immediate nuclear retalia retaliation or the Russians reacting in such a way which may lead to an immediate escalation. It's actually a pretty intelligent way to go about it. And what this also does is it spreads out, spreads out the focus of the Russian Defense Ministry. So instead of one sole country providing all the military support, drawing the entire ire of the Russian Defense Ministry, I mean, if it was just the UK sending these missiles 
and sending the tanks and sending all this stuff. I'm pretty sure that Russia, in spite of whether, you know, the UK is in NATO or not, Russia would have done something to the UK a long time ago. Uh, or whether it's Poland sending old Soviet stock warplanes, SU-24s, whatever they are, uh, SU-25s. Uh, it, it would likely, you know, Russia would have, by now, responded directly against those countries. But because it's so staggered, Russia acclimates to this new state of the normal in the conflict and but it's going to reach a point right now it's like russian roulette all of these nato members who continuously raise the bar like i don't know whose turn is it is to raise the bar next next it's probably going to be the fighter jets because there really is no bigger escalation in terms of you know ground-based vehicles in terms of uh, missiles you know, neck, the next escalation would be warplanes as far as this conflict is concerned. There's longer range missiles that could be provided to the Ukrainians. But uh, in terms of what they need right now, they have everything they need to target everything within their territory and Russian territory. Now, the agreement is that they are not supposed to use these weapons to target Russian territory. They view Crimea as Ukrainian territory, but because it's so incremental and because uh, they could effectively be targeting certain places in Russia. And if the, pl the thing blows up, you know, the Russians can't necessarily say that it, or it would be hard to prove. And I could be wrong about this, but I'm, I'm going to assume that it might be hard to prove. And in the, the cluster F of war, you know, are the Russians going to be so nitpicky that they're really concerned about one of these missiles hitting somewhere in Bryansk or Belgorod or one of the uh, Russian border states, that that is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. This is Russian roulette in the sense that one of these days, the next, whoever is the next country in the, the escalatory ladder that this prescripted rollout of these weapons, this mission creep, could be the one that gets the bullet. And I think... I think, you know, the United States realizes this. They were glad and relieved that the UK were the ones that sent the long-range missiles. But you got to ask yourself, why didn't they do it? Well, it's obvious why they didn't do it, because of this strategy that I'm talking about here today. So this is it. I mean, on top of that, in this new $1.2 billion weapons package, I talked about this yesterday, but this is likely the most significant development of all. And... It's not just the fact that they're going to have these long-range weapon systems. It's that they're also not going to have to rely on their own intelligence and reconnaissance and uh, guidance. They're going to be able to leverage the AWACS planes, the drones that are flying very close to Sochi right now. One of These drones are going to get shot down. Russia is going to have no choice. Mark my words, they are going to shoot down these drones. They're going to start shooting down NATO drones. They already pretty much did it. There was a technicality. They didn't officially shoot it down. They poured some gasoline on them, whatever, whatever they say. <clears throat> but this is it. This is the, the path of escalation is written. They got to keep this war going for the time being because there's political motivations. There are financial motivations. There are all kinds of hands in the honey pot right now. We don't want a lame duck president, so we got to keep the war going because there are no lame duck presidents during hot war times. I am not so confident, like some of you guys, that Donald Trump, with all the bluster about how he's going to end the war in a day, look, I'll take a wild card over a sleepy creepy at this point in time. What do we really have to lose? Okay, do I think that Trump and Biden are the, the epitome, the end all of the greatest minds that we could have running the country? Obviously not. There's 300 some odd million people in the United States. I'm pretty sure that there's somebody out there who, you know, is better than either of these two guys. But what I will say is I, I'll take a wild card over uh, what we've been doing thus far because this is a guaranteed path towards World War III that we are on right now. I mean, we're not on a path to World War III. We're in World War III. But one thing I'll say about Trump is that, and I've said this before, that North Korea was supposed to be this game-changing situation. He went for the first time with a photo op, and uh, he went, he crossed over the demarcation zone or whatever it was, or the demilitarized zone, 
and he shook the hands of Kim Jong-un was a big, huge publicized event. Everybody thought that that was the beginning of more positive relations with North Korea. And the year after that, what happened? North Korea did more launches of their ballistic missiles than they ever did before. So no, this is all bluster. There is far is a far more complex situation. You do not just pull out of a conflict like this, okay? It is going to get if, if they were to pull out right now, it would be it would be terrible for the US hegemony. The US dollar would immediately collapse if, if not maybe not immediately, but it would be problematic. And uh, it would just be the beginning of the end. And there's people, whether it's financial interests, and I'm talking about in the central bank sense, who realize this, there are financial interests in the military industrial complex sense. And there's also political interests at work here as well. And God knows what else is being buried in that country, if you know what I mean, if you're paying attention to all the political controversy <laughs> under Biden and that kind of thing. But um I have a sneaking suspicion that, that this is it. I mean, and, and they're keeping it on the hush-hush right now. Now, in terms of the counteroffensive starting, the Russians are denying it. Uh, Zelensky says that the counteroffensive hasn't started and it's being postponed, which is likely misdirection, meaning that it probably has started. And that the stuff going on in Bakhmut is actually perhaps more serious than the Russians are making out. But it's hard to say at this point. The fog of war is so thick. It could be you know, two, three move, four move, chess move, uh, misdirection in the sense that basically the, uh, the goal is to make it appear as though they are not getting ready when in fact they are getting ready. It's so hard to, to interpret at this point in time. Let me know what you guys think is going on right now. But all I will say is that this transfer of missiles and this new equipment that the Ukrainians have to leverage American recon equipment if they don't use that already is going to be a game changer in the conflict and one of these days russia is just going to snap and the question is who is going to get the bullet in this game of russian roulette okay what else do we got to talk about here today now interestingly we haven't talked about taiwan lately you know what yeah okay let's talk about taiwan Taiwan says its military will not let the U.S. blow up semiconductor factories. Can you believe that a, I think it was a Republican or was it a Democrat? I'm not sure who said it, but some member of Congress recently said that the U.S. should make it very clear to the Chinese that if you invade Taiwan, we're going to blow up TSMC. The audacity, the arrogance of such a statement, referring to, of course, the biggest chip manufacturer in the world, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. Now, when I think about this, I, for some reason, Nord Stream comes to mind. I don't know why, but Nord Stream is just coming. Maybe you guys can help me understand why. But uh, this is a representative, Seth Moulton. Maybe he's a Democrat from Massachusetts, it looks like. Okay, but, uh, and so... When asked about Moulton's con comments, Taiwanese defense minister said the following. He said the military wouldn't let that happen. It is the military's obligation to defend Taiwan and we will not tolerate any others blowing up our facilities. Okay, so this is serious because they're, they're, they're foreshadowing what's coming. Remember, what were Biden's comments about Nord Stream? This is the same thing. And... Uh, you need to understand about Falun Gong and how, you know, the, the history of the war between, you know, the, the, the Chinese and the, the, the Taiwanese, which are, which, which think that they're the, they believe that they're, as far as I, I, I understand, they believe that they are the true seat of power of the Chinese people. And that, you know, so there is a war going on there. And it's interesting to see this dynamic unfold where you really don't know, though, because we've seen what happened with Nord Stream and Germany is just hunky-dory with the whole thing. So you just never know. Taiwan is preparing for a potential assault on its cities. Emergency drills this year included for the first time an exercise simulating Beijing military strikes on Taipei. We have uh, allegedly... The United States is pointing the finger at South Africa now. South Africa is entering the conflict in terms 
of their giving weapons to the Russians potentially when that Russian warship went there. They're saying that the, the South Africans provided some artillery shells or whatever the heck. And finally, we have billionaire investor Stanley Druckenmiller. I would encourage you guys to go and listen to this guy, what he has to say. He is shorting the dollar. This guy has been very prescient in his predictions throughout the years. He is very measured. He's not alarmist, but he's shorting the dollar right now. And the dollar is, in fact, tanking and gold is going up. And uh, I'm not going to go into all the reasons why he is shorting the dollar. It should go without saying, if you've been watching this channel for some time, there is de-dollarization going on all around the world. You have the debt ceiling. You also have the <clears throat> perpetual debt bubble and the entitlement crisis that is coming for the U.S. government. All right. So go and check out Stanley Druckenmiller. Perhaps we'll do a deeper dive into his economic projections in the near future but it's not good and uh and this is in the best of times okay so please check out the videos that we've been releasing with gardening in canada it's time to get the gardens in like i said it's not just gardening on this channel we're going to be doing the bad boy stuff as well okay we're going to be breaking out the guns we're going to be blowing shit up we're going to be learning some tactical stuff from some of our tactical friends over at the ccfr and we got a green beret coming on the channel guys just stick with me we're in this together that's one thing i've realized more and more as i start networking with more and more people you start to realize and it's kind of a scary thought because when you're on the come up you you always think that you know, maybe people in the upper echelons know something I don't and are perhaps privy to some information that we don't have. And the truth is, is that they're not. They're just prepping just like the rest of us. I'm talking about the, the biggest celebrities you can possibly imagine are just prepping like the rest of us. Even some of the, the big wig elites. Okay, they're building bunkers and preparing for the uncertain times ahead, just like everybody else. And we are all in this together. And I, I just need to emphasize that because it's the truth. Uh, one last thing before I let you go. There is, I wasn't going to spill the beans on this until tomorrow, but the Wholesale Freeze Dry Company, if you use the coupon code Prepper Steak, they have some, they did a military contract recently. And when they do that, they're able to get really good deals on the meat. Okay. And um, because of this, because they want to give their customers a bit of a deal that the DOD provides them. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, Steve Cyros, the owner, we brought him on the channel a few weeks ago. He makes food for the military, for all the, you know, the, the elites to stockpile their bunkers. Occasionally we get a deal cut and he's going to be offering 20% off the price of the sirloin steaks that I believe it's sirloin steak. It's some kind of like pretty premium meat. Okay. The, the government has been buying a lot of freeze dried meat for some reason lately. Anyways, there's a limited supply. Use the discount code in the description. It's called prepper steak, all caps. I'll post a link. Check it out. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Canadian prepper out.